Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the online worship experience of the Morning Star Methodist Church. You might be able to tell that this is kind of the weekend after school has begun for Shelby County Schools. Uh, we have a lot going on with that, but today we're going to have a special blessing of the backpacks here in just a moment. But before we get into that, I want to remind you about three things. First of all, we're in the middle of a peanut butter offering. Did you know that our ministry partner of the Oak Mountain Mission they give away 500 jars of peanut butter on average per month. And right now the coverage are bare, so we're answering the call to give peanut butter to those who are underserved uh, with food. So if you'll uh, come to a live worship experience, we want to invite you to bring a jar of peanut butter with you. On September the 8th, we're going to have our back to school splash. Uh, lots of food, water slides for the grown-ups too. Uh, just a good time of community, so join us for that. And on that same day, we're going to start a brand new message series called Questions We're Afraid to Ask. Sometimes there are some questions we don't think we should ask out loud at church, but we're going to be asking them during that series. And I look forward to worshiping with you when we get into that series. Today, we're going to continue our new series called The Prophets of Doom. And you're going to find out that beyond a doomsday message, there's actually a powerful message of hope that the prophet Joel gives and the book called Joel from the Minor Prophets. So we're going to have a time here of prayer, a blessing of the backpacks, and then we're going to get into our worship time. Thanks for joining us today for the online worship experience. Please join me for our opening prayer. Jesus, bread of life, you give us life and nourish our spirits. Please help us walk in your ways each day. May we speak words of kindness to one another and open our hearts to share comfort and encouragement. May we choose to offer and seek forgiveness. Most of all, may we remember that your steadfast love is extended to all people, and your transformation of us knows no bounds when we give our lives to you. We pray this prayer in the holy and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
breaks, give them breaks in the high. It's that time of year again. Students prepare to launch into another year of reading, writing, and that dreaded arithmetic. Some students are sharpening their pencils for the very first time. Others are picking out a binder for the last time. Sack loads of supplies are being sorted. First day pictures are being snapped. All of them are stepping closer to who they will become. So let's do the math. What's the formula for a great year? They all have different stories, different ages, different dreams. But there's one common factor. They all need our support. So as each student prepares to launch into another school year, let's resolve to be part of the equation. Let us multiply prayers for students, teachers, administrators, and staff. Add encouragement to their school experience. Divide their load, helping to carry their burdens and teaching them to cast their burdens on God. And let us take on a new commitment, a fresh resolve to come alongside them, to learn and grow with them, loving them, helping them, and bringing their needs before the Father of instruction and author of understanding. Because their hard work, plus our support, gives them each the best chance at a very bright future. Well, friends, on this special weekend celebration, we have a specific thing that we want to pray about. And, and, and the most effective prayers are those that we can be specific with God about. And we're going to be praying about everything you could imagine going on with the new school year today as we do a blessing of the backpacks toward the end. But I'm going to invite you now to join us in this special prayer by joining in the part that you're going to see in the bold print. So let's pray for everyone that's involved uh, with the back to school season, so to speak, uh, now as a community of faith and as followers of Jesus. Join me now in this special back to school prayer and blessing of the backpacks in the part that's in the bold print. Dear Lord, as we begin this new school year, we gather once again as your community of believers. We thank you for the energy and the spirit that you renewed in us through the summer months. We thank you for the time to enjoy our family and friends and to reflect on what is important in our lives. Let this year be marked by enthusiasm and love so that with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we may continue to grow in our faith journey. Help all to fulfill your hope for them with honest intentions and works of faith. May they be gentle with themselves and bring laughter and joy to others. Father of all mercies, we ask that you would bless the youngest and the smallest of learners, the most helpless and powerfulness of persons, with your infinite and loving mercy. Grant them the strength to learn, concentrate, and act in love towards their teachers and fellow students. We also ask that you would watch over them at home and at school. Lord, we ask you to give proper direction so they may learn of your wonderful virtues. May this year be an amazing year for each person involved in this adventure. For those about to go to college, may you bless and reward their decision to become better servants by challenging them to be better people. May the halls of higher education receive them, stretch them, and make them ready for the next step of the journey. For those who teach, we ask that you enhance their love for children and their abilities to teach those same children. Make these teachers like waterfalls and their students like sponges. Strengthen them, uplift them, and give them your grace. For those who serve as support staff in our schools, 
May they remember that they are teachers in the office, on the bus, the hallway, and in the cafeteria. They work with your children, Lord. Let them teach through their actions and their valuable efforts of support, no matter how big or small those efforts might seem. And now, if you have your backpack there with you, just hold that up and we're going to do a blessing of the backpacks. Whose backpacks are these? Now to the Morning Star Church, will you fill these backpacks with your love, prayers, and support? We will. Let us continue to cover these students with prayer. God of wisdom and knowledge, enlightened by your Holy Spirit, those who teach and those who learn, make the schools of our community lively centers for sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom. We thank you for teachers and administrators. Continually renew and affirm in them a sense of calling to the sacred vocation of teaching. Give them loving hearts, wise minds, strong spirits, and a passion for their students. Fill them with joy, sustain and strengthen them, and give them rest when they are weary. Let them trust the seeds they plant even when they do not see the harvest. Let them hear deep within themselves your words, well done, good and trustworthy servant. We thank you for each student, their life among us, and the future before them. Lead them in your way, your truth, and your life. Let each classroom they enter be a place of life and light, warmth and welcome, discovery and growth. Give them good friends and let them be good friends for others. Set them at tasks which demand their best efforts and lead them to accomplishments which satisfy and delight. Let them not take failures and disappointments as a measure of their worth, but as opportunities for new learning and new beginnings. Open their hearts to life and their minds to learning. Let holy wisdom be their companion. Send your holy angels to stand guard and keep watch over all students, teachers, and staff. Let their names be always on the lips of your saints in prayer. Bless and keep them. Let your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. Accept and bless these backpacks to be for those who carry them a sign of your love and our love, support, and presence. O oh God, we long to know you and to love you, but the busyness of life often gets in the way. May we recognize this gift of a new beginning and the opportunity to learn, to create, and to wonder of endless possibilities. Be with us as we face the challenge of new tasks, the fear of failure, and the expectations of others. In our learning and our teaching, may we grow in service to others and in love for your world. We know that you are with us, leading us, and guiding us on our way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now, forever and ever. Amen. Today I am reading from the Old Testament book of the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 through verse 32. I will be reading today's scripture from the New American Standard Bible Translation of the Holy Bible. Joel 2, 28 through 32. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Hey boys and girls, I'm so glad you're with us today. So today we're talking about Joel. Joel, that's, that's not a name that we always hear when we talk about the Bible, right? It's not like a Peter or a John or a Joseph. It's not, but he was very, very important. Joel was one of the prophets, but before we get into that, I want to talk to you about something. I want to ask you, um, I'm going to play a little game called Who Am I? I'm going to give you some, some um, kind of clues, and I want you to try to figure out who I am, okay? It's kind of more of a what I am than a who I am. But here we go. I've got strong wings and I fly. The group I travel with is called a swarm. I'm very, very noisy when me and my friends are together. We are so loud. I eat crops. And our swarm, when we're, me and my friends are all together, we can clear complete paths through the land. What do you think I am? I'm a locust. Did you guess? Did you guess that's what I was? Now, last week we talked about Jonah, and I've got a scripture here I want to read. Jonah 4, 2, it says, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Joel was one of the many prophets that, had, he, that God had put on earth. And he was a prophet for the people who were living in Judea. Now, the people in Judea, they were sinning against God, and they were not doing what the Scripture had said they were supposed to do. So, God sent locusts, and they destroyed all the crops that the people were growing for their food. All the farmers were in trouble. God also sent a drought. Now, we know what a drought is. A drought is when we don't have any rain and everything is dried up and nothing can grow on the land. It was so dry, boys and girls, that fires started up and burnt all the crops that had grown. All the pastures would be, would be burnt and there would be nothing there for even the cows and the sheep to eat. The locusts, drought, fire. Boys and girls, these were all consequences of the sins that the people in Judea were doing that Joel was warning them about. Joel told the people to be sad for their sinful ways, for all their sinfulness, all the ways that they were breaking the, the laws that God had given them. He told them this. <clears throat> he said, put on con uncomfortable clothes. Oof. Nobody wants that. You want to have comfy clothes on. Spend time focusing completely on the Lord and cry out to the Lord for help. Joel said, who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, a grain offering and drink offering from the Lord your God. That's Joel 2.14. Joel told the Israelites that what they were doing was bad but that it wasn't too late. It's never too late to say you're sorry and to go back to God. He's waiting on you. Joel ended God's warnings with God's promises. And his promises were to restore the land, give them back all of the, the safeness that they needed, give them the food and the water. All they had to do was believe in him turn from their sinful ways. He would forgive them and he would bless them. Joel was a prophet of God. He was very important. He had a very important job. Today, you and I have God's Word, our Bibles, so that we can live and please God. So one of the things I want you to do this week is I want you to ask yourself, are you living in sin every day? And have you turned from God? Or are you running toward God and looking at all the wonderful words that He has in His Bible for us to bring us blessings and peace? Now we're going to close our eyes and we're going to lead our entire congregation in the Lord's Prayer. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a great week. See you soon. Well, friends, welcome to the second part of our series entitled Prophets of Doom. Now, before we get into our message today, I want to let you know that I have been practicing to be a prophet by screaming at people. I was just working in some pine straw and it did inappropriate things to my airspace. So I'm a little hoarse today dealing with allergies and stuff from working in the pine straw. Now, when most folks hear that term prophet, there's kind of a mixed bag of emotions and we call the series Prophets of Doom because we think there's bad news on the way if a prophet's involved. I've noticed that prophets spend a lot of time talking about spending eternity in damnation if we don't repent, but that's the last place that a prophet wants to go. And there's some prophets that are considered terrific because at the end of their sermon, there's a great awakening because most folks fell asleep during the message. Well, today we want to talk about a prophet named Joel. Now, Joel is considered one of the great minor prophets. Ironically, we really don't know much about Joel regarding his background. We know his father's name, but that's about it. His story most likely takes place around the 538 to 331 BCE or before Common Era time frame in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, I have a map there for you. Judah would be the part that's in blue on the map. There are some scholars that think that Joel may have been a friend of Nehemiah and Ezra, but we do not know this for sure. But what we do know is that Joel's name means Yahweh is God or whose God is the Lord. And there is no doubt when we're reading Joel's story that his Lord is indeed the one true God that we worship. Joel's message from God to Israel, it takes a lot of courage to deliver because he tells it like it is. He gives them the truth from God. And we're going to discover today that his message is also a primary component of our heritage as followers of Jesus and a bedrock of the first century church. Joel's prophetic message is in two parts. There is a need for repentance. That's the first part. And the second part is there is a hope of restoration for those who repent. Well, you may ask, what did the citizens of the southern kingdom of Judah need to repent about? Well, it was idol worship. And I know what you're thinking. How did this happen again to these people? Didn't they learn anything from their history of turning from God or the story of the Exodus? Well, Baal and Asherah were the male and female false gods that most of the people of that region worshipped. The farmers and the shepherds were drawn to the fertility God with their farming and livestock. They wanted their farms and they wanted their livestock to do well. A desert God, such as the God of the Exodus that they knew, had seen them through the wilderness of the Exodus story, probably wouldn't be as effective when it, comes, when it came to crops and breeding livestock in their minds, right? Well, because the area of agriculture was so lush and green, the Hebrews thought that the fertility God was truly more powerful than the desert God that their ancestors had followed through the Exodus story. One of the things that I notice about this story, friends, that's pretty, pretty relevant for us, is that before anyone falls away from God, outwardly, inwardly, they fall away from God. It's usually a common and slow drift for folks to drift as they explore what other people are doing and what other people say about faith. The wormhole of comparison, friends, it can take us into so many dark places from a spiritual perspective. Often we want what others seem to be doing that makes their lives perfect 
that we miss out on what God has in store for us when we're obedient to God. Another truth that's in this real life event is that it is easy to forsake our hopes and dreams. Indifference leads to spiritual sleep. Friends, when there is no hope, there is no dream. We get lulled to sleep and we fall in the patterns of what this culture calls the norm. And when we're spiritually asleep, we learn that anything or anyone we put ahead of Jesus or consider more valuable to us than Jesus is actually an idol. You see, friends, it's difficult to have dreams when we're struggling and our spirit is dry. By the time of Joel's story, they're experiencing a great calamity. We're going to talk about that. King Manasseh, King Ahaz, all these other kings of Judah began to worship these false idols. And they led the people to do so out of a dryness. They had forgotten who they were. They built this place of worship called a topeth for the purpose of making sacrifices to these false fertility gods in the spring for planting and in the harvest during the fall season. Well, you may ask, what were they sacrificing? Was it part of their crop? Was it an animal? No, that's not what they were sacrificing. They were sacrificing firstborn male children. You see, the ball statue had outstretched arms and was like a terracotta material that could have had a fire built within the back of the statue. They would get the altar idol very hot and then place that child on the arms of the idol to offer the child as a burnt offering for the planting in the spring and for the harvest in the fall. The leaders of Judah were offering up their own children for personal financial and material gain in their agricultural harvest and in their livestock production. Now, I have to tell you, I read that and that kind of makes me mad, kind of makes me angry. Uh, does it make you mad and angry to think of what they were doing to these firstborn male children? Now, can you imagine how that must have angered the heart of God? Not only that were they worshiping false gods, but they were killing their children. Joel was God's voice to speak against this type of altar worship. God's heart was so bro broken that God chose to discipline the people for turning to these false gods and adopting such cruel and unnecessary practices. God even had the prophet Jeremiah in the story of Jeremiah tell the kingdom of Judah that if they continue to consider this type of pagan sacrificing of innocent blood as being okay, that God would take the entire city of Jerusalem and turn it into a topeth or an altar of burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, God would lay waste to it. God provided a consequence for their choosing to worship all these other gods. What type of action would oppose a great harvest and a numerous livestock that they were doing these sacrifices for? It'd have to be an action that would destroy these things that had become idols to the people. This would get their attention. God used locusts. And when I say locusts, I'm not talking about cicadas that come around every 13 years here, but I mean grasshoppers. Think of grasshoppers. Now, the last major swarm to hit Israel was 1915. They were under British occupation at the time. The sky was filled with the swarming of these grasshoppers. Now, this is an actual photo. This is not a, a dirty windshield. And I want to share with you that in this swarming of these grasshoppers, all the lush vegetation of the land was eaten. In 1915, the last major uh, swarm that hit Israel, I want to show you a picture of one of the trees uh, before the locusts showed up. And then just about four days after they showed up, here is what happened to that tree. All the lush vegetation was eaten. The locusts were so numerous that they could swarm over an unguarded infant and devour its eyes within just a couple of minutes. A swarm of locusts can cover up to 460 square miles, and there's an estimated 80 to 160 million locusts in one square mile. In 2004, one swarm in Morocco measured 142 miles long and contained an estimated 69 billion locusts. One million locusts can consume enough food as 5,000 people in one single day. A locust can eat its weight each day, 
with a swarm eating more than 400 million pounds of plants in a single day. Now friends, that is an invasion, devastating on the earth, the vegetation, and it was a disaster economically and agriculturally. Talk about despair, because the locusts came and destroyed most of the vegetation. Then the female locust would lay millions of eggs in the soil, and when the larvae appear, it continues the devastation of that manifestation. The larvae then develop and the wings appear. They eat everything in sight. And then the destruction continues as they become adults and the cycle repeats itself over and over and the cycle can last up to seven years. Joel comes to the people and says, look, these locusts, they are God's judgment on Judah for turning all to this idol worship and for the shedding of this innocent blood. Wouldn't we all rather learn that lesson of not worshiping idols without having to deal with something that's going to devastate everything that we know. They felt desperate to fit in these Hebrews. So they turned to the false gods, just like the locals where they were living. They wanted to be like everyone else around them, but God did not create them to be like other people. God created them to be God's people. They were choosing to not be God's people. Their collective mindset was completely different from the mindset of God and God wanted them to change their minds to repent because sin will result in judgment and discipline for those who turn away from the one true God. You see friends, God is calling on God's people to dream dreams and to have visions because God wants to pour God's Holy Spirit into our hearts, our spirits and our minds. As Arrhenius says, says, the glory of God is man fully alive. And friends, make no mistake about it. God wants us to be fully alive in God. The prophet Joel reveals that the ultimate glory of God's promise fulfilled through Christ is God's church. Joel was crying out to the people that a better life awaited them than the life that they were pursuing by following all these false gods and from having everything they had destroyed by these locusts. Now, could it be possible that God works through the tragedy, the hardship, and the difficulty that we may face in this fallen world as a means of discipling us today? I believe so. In fact, the scripture teaches that. Hebrews 12 reminds us, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? For us. That discipline can help us reach a very important decision. And that decision is to change our mind to follow God's mindset. We call that repentance. And friends, God calls us to repentance. And in Joel chapter 2, he's not talking about just a show of repentance to where they rent their clothes and tear their clothes. He's talking about a rending of the heart in which we make a difference on the inside and let God transform us. You see, God's judgment follows the disobedience of people. But God has made gracious provision that we might not have to experience the judgment and the wrath if we repent and turn to God. Because, friends, our God is gracious, merciful, and abounding in love. And Joel shared all of this with Judah, that their lives did not have to be that way. They wouldn't have to lose everything they had as a consequence of their sin. But the people had chosen to pursue those gods and the things of this world. Friends, God's intention is to forgive us and receive us and restore us into right relationship with God. Now, for those of us who are following in the ways of Jesus, modeled after the first century church, the very first church, the words of Joel are all throughout the Holy Spirit inspired words of the early church. He's quoted actually in Romans chapter 10 where it says, The message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. 
If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, what a reassuring thing this is for followers of Jesus. But let's not talk about what we actually do even today in the 21st century. We like to justify our sinful behavior by comparing ourselves to everyone else because no one is perfect, right? If we're honest, how many times have we said, Lord, I know I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty sinful person, but I'm nowhere near as bad as that other person that I work with or maybe that other parent uh, that lets their kids just run wild. Well, friends, other people are not the standard. God doesn't measure us by the actions of others. God has given us a standard as Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, no one else is to be our standard. You see, friends, God is not grading on the curve as to whether or not we're as bad as someone else because God evaluates each person on their choice of embracing the life of Christ over their sinful nature. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And friends, repentance is a gift because repentance leads us to restoration. Watching so many of the children this week returning to school reminds me of the promise that each one of us has as a child and, and how we like to dream big. The people of Judah had dreamed big, but after going through these sinful choices and then the consequences of those choices, they became spiritually dry. They became kind of visionless. And what we learn is that in school, we have a lot of dreams and we have a lot of hopes, but then we get out and real life kind of happens. And we know, if we're honest, that sometimes real life can batter those dreams and then we end up settling for less than what the dream was for our lives or that we had envisioned. And when we go through a dry season of life, friends, it is easy, very easy, to give up on those hopes and to give up on those dreams. We tend to turn to and place our hope in things that are, are way beneath the Lord Jesus. And that shouldn't be so for followers of Jesus. You see, the great promise of Joel is that one day God will restore God's presence fully among the people of God. When Joel talks about a pouring out or an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that word that Joel uses to describe this promise to pour is a forceful movement of water, like a waterfall or attempting to run through a fire hydrant. Joel says that this outpouring is going to be lavish. It's going to be exuberant, almost wasteful. Not a drizzle, friends, but a downpour. Isn't that just like God to give us far more than we expect when we're faithful to follow God's ways? You see, God wants to bless all those who choose to follow Jesus. And I'm not talking about financial blessings like some televangelists. I'm talking about providing for the basic needs of life and for directing us in the way that God wants us to go with our strengths and our purpose. Ephesians chapter 3 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I heard someone tell a child this week uh, this little saying that the sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. Maybe you've heard that. Why do we say things like that when there are human footprints on the surface of the moon at this very moment? You see, we may have goals in our life, but God has a bigger purpose than any of us could ever realize. Is the joy of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit overflowing in your life in an abundant way like the prophet Joel talks about? Friends, God's message, it, it does not change God wants greater for us. And God's message is always about repentance. 
but it's about turning back to God through Jesus. This is what God wanted of the Judeans, and this is what God wants of us. God's forgiveness, God's transformation, God's blessings are available to those who turn to Jesus. You see, transformation is a reset for those who worship the one true God. God's blessings are exuberant and they're lavish. So please don't settle for what this world says is the best because it's not the best. Only God's way is the best. So let's all repent, change our minds. Let's reset. Let's be transformed. And friends, let's be blessed.
These are our questions for reflection. According to Joel, who was included in God's promise to pour out the Holy Spirit of God? According to Joel, who was included in God's promise to pour out the Holy Spirit of God? When you think about the importance of God's Holy Spirit being poured out into the world, what does that say to you about the importance of living the good news each day? When you think about the importance of God's Holy Spirit being poured out into the world, what does that say to you about the importance of living the good news each day? Have you ever considered that when you heard the good news of Jesus, God was pouring God's Holy Spirit into you? Have you ever considered that when you heard the good news of Jesus, God was pouring God's Holy Spirit into you? In what ways has God lavishly poured out the Holy Spirit into your life? In what ways has God lavishly poured out the Holy Spirit into your life? When was the last time that you stopped to dream and envision a future led by God's Holy Spirit? When was the last time that you stopped to dream and envision a future led by God's Holy Spirit? Do you think God would settle for anything less than greatness in the people of God? Do you think God would settle for anything less than greatness in the people of God? How can we demonstrate God's lavish love and goodness to someone in our lives? How can we demonstrate God's lavish love and goodness to someone in our lives? Please join me for our closing prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive us for when we avoid your hard truths. Please grant us your mercy when we look for the easy path and avoid the path you set before us. Guide us back to where you would have us go. Strengthen us to face the challenge of living faithful lives and of following your lead. Forgive us and renew us. Lord, that we may abide in your truth and abide with you forever. We, who were far away, have been brought near in the grace of Christ. We, who were once lone individuals, are united as one body, one family of God, to share God's unifying love with the world. We pray this in the name of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus. Amen. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord will be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down the name of the Lord will be praised. So praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us for the online worship experience. I look forward to worshiping with you again next weekend when we continue with our Prophets of Doom message series. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do to help. We're here to serve. We're here to help you on your faith journey. You, know, you can send me an email at pastor at mstarchelsea.com or call us here at the office at 205-678-2572. Love to hear your story and see if there's anything that we can do to help you in your faith journey. Blessings on you, friends.